Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So today we're going to be going to be going into multi well continuing multi locus extensions, uh, specifically going into polygenic inheritance. So last video we talked about two gene interactions such as epistasis. Today now how do multiple genes lead to one phenotype? So this is known as polygenic inheritance, uh, specifically of quantitative characters is what we're going to talk about today. This is where again multiple genes affect one genotype. So this will typically be inherited as a quantitative character. So what is a quantitative character? To the best define the quantitative characters here or continuous characters, I first like to define a discrete character, which is what we've been talking about up until this point. It's when something is either this, that, or that only a few distinct forms. So example, like fur color and lab coat color for epistasis here, brown, black, or yellow fur. So discontinuous meaning it doesn't, not like a bell curve in a way. So these are called discrete characters. Again, these are a few distinct phenotypes encoded by one or a few genes. In comparison, a quantitative character or a continuous character are examples like weight, height, skin color. So, you know, fur, Height. You're either short, there's very short people or very tall people, and then there's a whole bunch of people in the middle. So it's a continuous spectrum between the two. So there are many phenotypes between two extremes. Another thing that plays a major role here are environmental factors. Now we're, gonna, we're not going to talk about environmental factors directly today. So next video, we're going to be going into the complementation test and anticipation. Then the video after that, we'll, you know, end of chapter five and talk about some environmental factors that play a role into this. So think about something like weight. Environmental factors would be what you eat. Obviously that plays a major part to weight, but also your you know, inherited genetics plays a part to your weight as well. Um, but here again, quantitative character, many phenotypes between two extremes. So when we talk about these, they're usually inherited as, as what are called quantitative trait loci or QTL. So you might hear it for as to a QTL region. So these are chromosome regions that contain genes that affect a quantitative character. So if I were to draw a chromosome here, there'd be a region up here, which would contain the QTL for whatever that region might be for. Now there are three types of quantitative characters we find. One is a continuous quantitative character, that's any value between two extremes. The next one is a meristic one, that's any whole number between two extremes. So these sound similar, but this one's any value and this is any whole number. Uh, and I'll give some examples here going through. And then we finally have a threshold character, which is a binary phenotype determined by continuously varying susceptibility. Usually this means susceptibility to disease. So now here, continuous any value between two extremes, let's use uh, height as our example. You can either be short or tall. Then here's number of individuals. So, you know, fewer short people, a lot more medium height people, and fewer tall people. So this exists as a bell curve. It's a poorly drawn bell curve, but it's a bell curve, and you can see how it's any value between two extremes. You could lie here, here, any value within this bell curve is possible. Whereas a meristic character is any whole number between two extremes. So here a good example is litter size or the number of pups. So when you have, not you, but when a dog has puppies or a mouse has a litter. Uh, so you just, let's say we're going from zero, you know, you can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's just go to eight to keep it simple. And then here is the frequency and let's say we go from zero to 0.4 or 40% chance. So a lower chance of having one, two might be a little higher, three might be higher. Let's say four is the highest percent chance, five might be a little higher, but notice here how you know three is here and five is there. That's not necessarily a true bell curve then, then six might be down here, then seven and eight are very rare. Uh, so it doesn't exist as a true bell curve sometimes. It's still close, but it's any whole number. You can't have 3.3 pups. Like, you know, one might die, but that wouldn't be, that would be considered three then. Uh, so that's just what meristic means. Any whole number, just think it rounds. And then here, a threshold character. Uh, when we look at threshold characters, we're looking at um, as it increases, it increases susceptibility to disease. So then over here would then be number on the y-axis, number of individuals. So if we're using something, it still look like a bell curve here, but then over here you, heat, you meet this threshold value. Again, remember this is binary. 
but pretty much it doesn't matter if you're in here, this is zero, and then this is one. One meaning you then have a higher susceptibility to that disease after past this threshold. And there are a few diseases that can exist like that that have this threshold state to them. So some cancers, autism, and things like that. So determined by continuously varying susceptibility up here for a fewer number of those individuals. And it's part of these quantitative uh, characters. So continuing these quantitative trait loci here in polygenic inheritance, we talk about additive genes. So again, this is polygenic. Uh, additive, well, additive alleles. Easiest definition ever, they add to each other. Um, so each allele adds to the trait. So I'm using a simple example here showing how the amount of green increases based on how many dominant alleles there are. So let's say, you know, we're starting out here as homozygous recessive. There are no dominant traits there. So it'd be zero and it's a light green color. It doesn't produce as much pigment. And then with each dominant allele that's added, you start producing one more concentration of pigment. So each of these, so this is written like, you know, multiplication table here, they add this way. So this one would be um, this one right there. So big A, little A, little B, little B. Um, so one adds there. So it's a little darker of a green. And then when you add two, let's say we have a homozygous one here. Now that's slightly more darker. Um, and then you can have three. So three it's, would be, again, slightly more darker. Then, of course, you can have four where they're all homozygous dominant, and that's the darkest. So some alleles are found like this as well. They, sometimes they can add height to plants and things like that, depending on the hormones produced. Um, this one's just showing pigment production for this green color in this chart, but sometimes we do find additive alleles in this polygenic inheritance. And there's a little calculation you can do with these. Um, oh, I think wheat color is another example. So like the little flower on the wheat plants. The number of possible phenotypes is equal to 2n plus one, where n is equal to the number of polygenes. So in this case, we have two polygenes. So this is one polygene, and that's the other. So the number of possible phenotypes, we can calculate that by taking two times two plus one, not plus five, that's what it equals, it equals five. So you don't have to fill in this table, you can just be like, oh, if we have two, two polygenes that are additive, we're gonna have five different phenotypes, and that's what we have here, one, two, three, four, five phenotypes. It makes sense, but think about if there's, if it is an additive polygene, and there's something like five polygenes. Then you do this calculation, see there's a very vi wide variety of phenotypes. And you can do additional calculation here, a 0.25 to the n. This is the proportion of the F2 resembling one of the two homozygous parents. So assume, you know, you do the standard Mendelian cross here of two true breeding parents. And then, you know, all those offspring are going to be heterozygotes. You cross those with each other, you do the, you know, that dihybrid heterozygous cross. You know, we're used to seeing that 9331 ratio with this, and you'll get that ratio, but it won't look the same because the phenotypes are different. They're additive alleles. So you can calculate with this how many of those will look like one of the original parents. So 0 0.25 to the n, or n is equal to 2, is equal to 0 0.0625, or 1 16th of that F2 generation will look like the parents. Um, so interesting calculation you can do there to test that. Um, so kind of neat. This does have a few assumptions that comes with it. One is, so the additive genes with equal effects. So let's say if the second gene here enhances it a little bit more, produces a stronger enzyme color production. Not the same, of course. Uh, so think of it in hormone production. If it's something like height, something that adds something like a centimeter, if one hormone is stronger than the other hormone, not the same. Uh, also, unlinked loci. You can't have these genes located close together on the same chromosome because then they'd be inherited together and they won't separate, follow the law of independent assortment, especially for doing calculations like this. And also no environmental effects. So if this was plant color here and how green the leaves got, watering it more nutrition-wise and things like that, you can't make that comparison with it 
as well. All right, that's all I have for this video. So I wasn't sure how to break up these next three here. So they might be a little bit shorter. Next video, we're going to go into the complementation test and anticipation. I wanted that one to be a separate one. And then finally, we're going to be talking about environmental effects. And that will finish up our chapter five here. All right. Thank you all for watching today. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And if you get to this point and you are okay writing in the comments, say hi. I'd like to know who's out there and watching. I'm having a lot of fun making this series and hopefully I can get through it all right now. Uh, there's about, you know, 30 to 40 people watching each of these videos. And that, to me, that's like a class, you know, I don't know if you're from my YouTube follows or from my Twitch, uh, but I'm just happy that I'm kind of like almost teaching a class here on YouTube. And there are a few of you that are following along and watching. And it's just, I like seeing that. And it just makes me, keeps me motivated for continuously to making these. I plan to make more courses in the future. So like anatomy and physiology one and two, immunology, microbiology, bio one as well. So all these courses I'm trained to teach, I'd love to bring to YouTube and make open access courses for everyone to be able to watch. So thank you for supporting the channel and being here. Just adding that to the end of this video today. And no one will probably ever hear it and make it to this part of the video anyway. So that's why I say say hi in the comments if you see it. All right. Have a great day, everyone. And bye bye.